Good afternoon. Uh, this week we are discussing international organizations, namely one type of international organization, which are intergovernmental organizations. Next week we'll discuss other non-state actors in the sphere of international relations, <coughs> including international non-governmental organizations uh, and multinational corporations and other non-state actors. This week, however, we are discussing intergovernmental organizations. So in addition to all the materials posted online and your readings, uh, in, this, uh, in these lectures I'm going to try to connect a few dots and discuss about uh, a couple uh, of uh, international governmental organizations, intergovernmental organizations, uh, that we will use as case studies. So international governmental organizations or intergovernmental organizations, IGOs, um, are of many types, right? Uh, they are formed uh, perhaps regionally, uh, between states in a region, perhaps worldwide. They are formed for various reasons. They can be with the military purpose, they can be with an economic purpose, they can be for any purpose you can imagine, right? Obviously the key issue is what? That the members of these organizations are states. But these organizations then become actors who act on their own uh, or the states act through these common organizations. Now in this week's uh, case studies we will discuss two important cases, two major cases so to speak, but they're kind of inappropriate for what we're trying to discuss because they are the exception basically to the rule. And both the United Nations and the European Union are things that are quite strange, they don't fall within the typical um, uh, international uh, intergovernmental organization uh, notion. They go beyond that, right? However, they're so important that we have to discuss them. But we also talk about NATO, which is a typical IGO, only that it with one specific function, which is military. <clears throat> so let's talk uh, about the, uh, the United Nations. What is the United Nations? Well, to understand what the United Nations is, we have to understand what is its origin, where does it come from? Um, and uh, in order to do that, we have to go back to World War I. After World War I, uh, remember what was World War I. It was the uh, natural consequence and the natural completion of all that quote-unquote <coughs> balance of powers system of the 19th century, which was based on continued competition between states, continued armament, continued military economic uh, competition. So that exploded in World War I. So this is why, after this sort of, remember, realists like the 19th century and the balance of power uh, image. Uh, <clears throat> after World War I, there was an impetus around the world after that catastrophe when millions and millions of people died, uh, continents were, parts of continents were destroyed. There was this impetus from many actors around the world to well, find out alternate solution. This idea of con continued competition and you know, you're always at the brink of the disaster. I mean, who can live in that situation? So that was the heyday of a, of a liberal or idealist impetus to find solutions to, uh, to, to this uh, global uh, insecurity, right, to the fact that there is no global government. And one of the attempts that was, that was uh, pursued uh, was the League of Nations. And the League of Nations, in many ways, can be looked at as a predecessor uh, uh, to the United Nations, in a way. Now, the League of Nations originated from Woodrow Wilson, the US President's famous 14 points, in which he proposed a program to um, uh, how to solve the situation after World War I, right? This was before the peace treaty, the Versailles, uh, Paris peace treaty. So, World War I is done, <coughs> what should we do? Woodrow Wilson's 14 points set up a program. And he set up two major things, two major principles. One is self-determination, give every quote-unquote nation its own state, quote-unquote, uh, which obviously was a disastrous suggestion in many ways. Uh, and the second one, <coughs> because of the difference between nation and state that we discussed. Uh, and the second one is the idea of um, you know, basically the Kantian idea that your textbook talks about uh, and uh, the idea th that we have discussed in previous sections of creating a worldwide system of collective security. And this was the so-called League of Nations. Now notice again the name, it talks about League of Nations, it's actually League of States. Right? 
So this was the idea of creating a system of collective security. Now what is collective security? I understand this. Collective security is something very specific. It's not an alliance, it is not collective defense. Collective security, you have to imagine it some, some, some of like, like this. Here are all the actors in the world of international relations at that point, that these are states, right? A system of collective security creates um, an overarching bond between all of these actors with the idea of creating security within this group. So it unifies all these actors in a system in which they all uh, uh, pledge themselves to act if security is threatened to any actor from any other actor. So a League of Nations was planned to be a world wide, world encompassing system in which all the states are a member and they pledge themselves to crush down any threat to security uh, within the system and to any member, right? That's collective security. And your book gives you the principle, and that was one of the questions from the text. Now, what is collective defense? Collective defense is different. Let's say it's the same situation. These are the actors in the system. Collective defense is these actors here yeah, form a system of collective defense in which they pledge themselves to protect each other from any attack or threat from the outside. And that's collective defense. Right? So, if one actor is attacked, all of the others will respond in defense, and that's collective defense. You see now the difference. Collective security creates a space of security within the system. Collective defense unifies the number of actors against threats from the outside. Collective security is basically is the, at the heart of why the UN will be established and why the League of Nations wanted to be established. Collective defense is NATO. NATO is a collective defense system. An alliance is something else. It's an alliance between two actors or, or three and so on. That's a whole different story. I mean, it's a different story. So you see, these are different concepts. Now, the League of Nations started with these wonderful ideas, but it failed. Why did it fail? Well, it failed, uh, first of all, because the major actors, the US, US, uh, USSR at that point, did not become members from the beginning. U.S. stayed out from the beginning, which was quite ironic, given that it was the president of the U.S. who uh, basically designed it. But it's 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 part of how foreign policy is made in the U.S. Right? It's not the president who makes foreign policy. He takes the initiative, but the Senate, the Congress through the Senate has to approve it, and it never did approve it. So you see, here's where foreign policy is not made by one guy, even if he's the big president. Um, so the League of Nations failed um, for, for these reasons, but also for reasons of that the, major, the other major actors, Germany, Japan, actually were not interested in having a system of peace, but they were themselves militaristic. You know, obviously they caused them the start of World War II. So you, uh, and, and that the League itself has proven ineffectual in several crises that occurred, and the League was not able to act. And that led to its demise. Well, then you have World War II, which was an even worse disaster than World War I. Uh, you have to try hard to top that one, but we managed to do it. So after World War II, you know, after you give, after you put your house on fire twice, you might think about getting, getting a better system. Right? You might think about it. So that's what happens after World War I. So that's the origin of the United Nations. It's not in direct integration of the League of Nations, but you see that there, are some, there, are, there is a preamble, there, is, there are some roots. So the United Nations is formed in 1945. Um, 51 states, which is a huge number, sign um, the, the, the first agreement. Uh, and uh, why is it formed? Again, the United Nations and why after World War II? Again, because they, it wants basically to create a worldwide system to prevent having another world war, basically. To prevent uh, threats to peace, to prevent threats to security. And how does it do it? It does it by reinforcing the principle of you know, the sovereignty of the states. So it's built on the idea of its members, remember our states, and it's built on the idea of protecting their security through collective action. But it, the way it is set up, as you'll see, it is set up so that it can also, it can actually act. That is not uh, reduced to the, to the position of an ineffectual, uh, you know, just a formal uh, organization.
and the League of Nations was accused to be. So the purpose of the United Nations is to basically protect peace uh, around the world. That's the initial purpose. Now it has changed since then. It came around as this basically coalition of the well, the national organization of the states in the world to manage threats to security and peace, but it has become much more. Today, uh, the UN is, is, first of all, the UN is not a world government, so no, forget about it, the United Nations, is, there's no, there is no world government, right? So what is the UN? It's a symbol, first of all, of the fact that there is international, an international uh, identity, there is such a thing as mankind, us, United Nations. Two, it is a unique place and a unique forum for the states to come and meet each other, because at the UN all the states are represented, which means that Iran's representatives can meet with the US representatives in principle, Cuba's with whatever, uh, so even countries that are at war can meet there, which remember in a state of conflict that's the first thing that falls apart. For example, the US does not have a, an embassy in the Iran, Iran does not have an embassy in the US otherwise. There is no diplomatic relations between these two countries. But at the UN, all states, which are considered to be the main actors and the only important actors, meet and uh, can... Uh, it's, so it's a unique place. It is also... Uh, think of it as a, as, a, as, a, as a unique platform. So uh, this, there's nothing like it. There's, not, there's no all-encompassing um, platform that deals with the problems of the world. There's nothing like it in the world. So this is why, as you see, it has developed into much more, because all kinds of other initiatives that have dealt with worldwide problems attach themselves to the UN. Because, well, where do you go to try to create a program to eradicate hunger in the world, right? There's no other worldwide platform where all the most important, most powerful actors uh, meet and you can address them, but the UN, right? So it's, it's a very important platform. It also became an agent of development and and um, um, uh, worldwide. So it's an important agent of development. It is also a unique source of information because there's again no other platform where information about the world is collected, about the entire world. And when we're going to look at the programs briefly, you'll see what I mean. So it is many things. It's a symbol, it's a forum for states to meet and, and resolve conflicts and, and debate. It's a, it's, an, um, it's a platform of common worldwide action. It is an agent of world development. It is a unique source of information and planning, again, worldwide. So the three pillars, or the three major issues with which the UN deals are uh, security, economic development, and human rights. And all of these, these now have become, so it does, remains the initial goal of security, then you have the goal of development, and then you have the goal of protecting individual human rights. And all of these kind of become part of the nature of what the UN is. But remember that the UN Charter, and I links, uh, um, uh, linked it to, on Canvas, and you should look at ch uh, Chapter 6 and Chapter 7 there of the Charter, basically it's Constitution of the UN, that the UN Charter is based on the principles that the states are equal and sovereign actors. So it's, it's a state-based system, although it's called again the United Nations, it's actually the United States. Okay, um, so let's look, at, uh, let's look at its structure, the structure of the institutional structure of the UN, right? First of all, who are, who are the members of the UN? Actually, most states on the, in the world, most states on the globe, are members and every state that sort of you know being a member of the UN has become a way of being recognized as a state. It's like if you're you know member, you the world has a, a, acknowledged your existence. Remember, statehood is a you know it's a construct. It's an arbitrary, well more or less arbitrary convention. So you know in order to exist, you who proves that you exist as a state, right? It's basically the other states. So most states are, although there are some interesting uh, you know, exceptions. For example, Switzerland only became a member of the UN in 2003. Or, uh, for example, Taiwan, which used to be recognized as China. Ch Taiwan calls itself uh, China, by the way. Um, I'm not going to go into the history here. But then there was a switch and the People's Republic of China was recognized as China and Taiwan uh, not. Uh, or there are others who have an interesting status, uh, they are uh, uh, 
observer, they have an observer status, or uh, are only in the process of becoming recognized as a state. Uh, and that's the example of, for example, Palestine. Right? So anyway, uh, it's an interesting process, but anyway, in, in, in general, right, all the recognized states are members of the UN. So there are, uh, these are the few, these are the major institutions within the UN. Um, so let's let's uh, put it here. So first of all, you have the general assembly, and the general assembly is basically you think of it as the world parliament in a way, although it's not. <laughs> uh, but it's it's where all the states are that are members have a seat in the general assembly, as the name says, is the general assembly of all the states. Members in the that are members in the UN. There are about uh, there are 193 members today, and some permanent uh, observers. For example, the Vatican is a permanent observer, which is a state, by the way. Uh, but it, in the UN, it's not a full member; it's just an observer. It meets in plenary session, the General Assembly, every year from September to January, and so on and so on. What does the General Assembly do? It's not a parliament because it cannot pass laws. Again, the UN is not the world government. So it's not a parliament, so what is it? Uh, it, it? What can it do? So what the General Assembly does is it passes resolutions, so which are not laws, but there are decisions uh, that indicate that all the members of the General Assembly, all the states, the majority of the states of the world are of one opinion. And even if these resolutions are not binding, they don't have the power of law, because there is no police to apply it, or there is no administration to chase you down if you don't respect it, Right, which is what the government has. However, they have this, they have significant uh, f formal and informal, uh, symbolic and you know concrete authority. Right, They're, this is basically the states of the world have spoken. So resolutions are important. They, they give us you know a, a, a voice to the states of the world. Remember that every state in the world has an equal, just one seat each. Tiniest state, Luxembourg, to the largest state, China or India or uh, uh, so, uh, Russia, uh, Brazil, whatever. So they're all individual, considered to be one individual after each. So it passes resolutions, it controls the finances of the UN, including the budget of the peacekeeping, and that's an important power. That's an important power. It coordinates the work of many UN agencies and programs, which are listed in the on campus there. It elects important positions that we're going to talk about to, in other institutions of the UN. It decides the uh, acceptance, the accreditation of new members, again important power, decides to recognize a state as a state and then to accept it as a member. Um, and it has its own other committees in you know, dealing with different issue areas. And there's the General Assembly. And then we have the Security Council. The Security Council is a very strange thing. It, it, its existence is due to basically the experience of the failure of the League of Nations. And <clears throat> uh, why, which was again, why? Because, it was, because the League of Nations proved to be ineffectual and because of the big powers stayed away from the League of Nations. Now this is meant to take care of that. So the Security Council, this is why it has one, two, three, four, five permanent members. Permanent members. They can never lose their seat. Who are these? These are the five states that were considered to, considered to be the big powers after World War II. And that is the US, the United Kingdom, Britain, France, Russia, and China. You see why it's important. And then there are ten non-permanent members. So, in total 15, right? Ten non-permanent members. And these are elected for two years uh, by the General Assembly. So that's one of the positions they elect. They send 10 members, and these states are, you know, the names change every two years. You have again the links uh, on campus, uh, and they are from all the continents. So today we have Angola, Chad, Chile, Jordan, Lithuania, Malaysia, New Zealand, Nigeria, Spain, and Venezuela. So, what does the Security Council do? This is at the heart of this collective security principle is the Security Council. Because only the Security Council has the power, according to the Charter of the UN, again, 
look up those chapters 6 and 7. Only the Security Council has the power to decide when there is a threat for peace and also to decide on, the, uh, on what are the steps to be taken. You're going to say, well, why can't the General Assembly do that? Can they pass resolutions? The difference is that the decisions by the Security Council are binding, which means that they have to be executed. And how do we know that they will be executed? Well, guess what? These are also the most powerful states in the world. Well, you were um, uh, in 1947. 1947. Uh, so, notice that then, look at the char charter and look at chapter 6, which says what should be done in case of a threat for uh, security, the non-violent means that can be evolved. The fact that the Security Council can decide on non-violent means, and chapter 7 is the key one, because chapter 7 of the charter says that when there is a threat of security that was, to security that was identified by, by the Security Council, Notice the name, Security Council. Uh, and they have the right to decide to intervene violently, to apply violence, to apply force, to send troops. So the charter, which is the charter that is signed by all the states in the world, gives the power to the Security Council to apply force, to, to approve the application of force on those members who are, by the way, here them, themselves, right? Because all the states in the world are members here. On those members who have broken peace, who have broken the, the agreement of security. That's collective security. All the members are part of it, all the states are part of it, and they agree to apply force on any of themselves which, who broke the peace, who break the peace. And this is the tool to which they do that. Now, how does the Security Council take decisions? You need to have nine out of the 15 members agreeing. And you're going to say, well, that's nice. There are 10 who are smaller countries, five bigger countries. Well, I think we're, we're, we're fine here. Well, no, because this is another reason why the permanent members are so important. Uh, the permanent members have veto power. So if one of the permanent members does not agree, the whole thing falls apart, even if you have 14 others voting yes. And that's Giving, them, giving the big powers veto power is what allows for the system to function. You know, you have to give the big guy, you know, more candy in order for him to, uh, to, to, to agree to participate in this uh, common protection program, basically. I apologize for the image. Um, so, so the Security Council is, is obviously very, very... <laughs> Uh, uh, powerful and very important. However, it's also controversial. The question is, are these five countries, which were the big powers or considered to be the big powers at the end of World War II, actually still the big powers? Should we still have these the permanent members? How about Japan? How about Germany? Economically, they are more powerful than more, most of those countries there, actually. You know, and even militarily they can be. How about the, the rising you know, forces of Brazil or India? Uh, or Nigeria and Africa, let's say, or, you know, there, are, there, is a, there is a worthwhile debate. The problem is that it's very hard to agree how to reform the Security Council. But truly, it is sort of awkward to have, you know, because these are the, you know, the f former big powers, not necessarily still at the same position in which they were, but anyway, it's very hard to reform this. Okay, um, there is another important body which is ECOSOC. Uh, important in terms of functionality, we're not going to hear much about it, but it's basically another body, uh, institution within the UN, it has 54 members which are states, right? 54 states are members, and it is the Economic and Social Council. It basically manages the UN development programs, so that's what it is. Let's stick with that. And then there is a secretariat, and the Secretary General. Now, the Secretariat is the administrative heart of the UN. Here are all the UN civil servants, the UN bureaucrats. This is the body that runs the institutions of the UN, the everyday work of the UN, and, right? That's the Secretariat. So you have basically the UN civil servants. A special position is the Secretary General. The Secretary General is basically the face of the UN. He's not the president of the world, is not the president of the UN either. But the Secretary General is, is the only person that has this 
symbolic role of representing being the face of the of mankind in a, in, in a way, right, of, of the United Nations. Uh, so the roles played by the Secre uh, Secretary General, General are one, symbolic, second, administrative, meaning it runs, he is, as I said, the Secretariat runs the machinery of the, of the UN, all the programs. He is the, basically the CEO of that, he, he makes it sure that it works, and he also sort of has a sort of a leadership role, right? Symbolic, administrative, and leadership, because he's, he has um, uh, the power or the role to bring issues to the attention, for example, of the Security Council. He is the formal day-to-day -day leader of the United Nations, um, and so he can kind of also impose, well, Drive, uh, drive the activity of the United Nations, he put some priorities, kind of shape its direction, uh, and so on. Uh, the Secretary uh, General is uh, nominated, how is he appointed? He's nominated by the Security Council and is approved by the General Assembly. So you see another position that the General Assembly uh, elects, basically, or approves after the nomination of the Security Council. Usually the Secretary Generals are people from not the big powers, so they're from smaller countries or, 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 or you know, not those who are major players otherwise. So the pre some of the previous ones came from Egypt, the current one, Ban Ki-moon, comes from South Korea. He used to be the foreign minister of South Korea. He's on the cover of your, of your Goldstein and Peef House book, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with that South Korean uh, singer. His name escapes me. Um, okay, and then there is another interesting uh, uh, institution which is the International Court of Justice. Now, your book mentions it, the Ghostin and Thief House book mentions it as the you know, World Court. I don't, I'm not fond of that name, so let's stick with International Court of Justice because it is not the court World Court. That's the whole point. Uh, there can't be a, a court unless you have the institutions that apply the decisions and enforce the decisions of a court. If the Supreme Court or any court in the U.S. takes a decision, well, just because those people dressed funnily, said something, doesn't mean it's going to be real. Right? The judges are not going to come to your door to say, well, pay your fines, right? The Supreme Court justices, Sotomayor is not going to come and disturb you during dinner to say, well, wait a minute, you didn't do this and that. Right? Who but how do we know that the, that the courts, what makes the courts and their decisions effective is the fact that there is a system of other institutions that apply the decisions of the courts. The courts take a decision, it's the cops who come and take it away. Right? The courts apply a decision, there are other institutions that enforce those. Now there is no such thing at the level of the world, just because there is, just like there is no worldwide government, just like there is no worldwide police and the worldwide army or whatever. So, then what is this International Court of Justice? Plus, there is no worldwide law, right? There is, because you don't have a worldwide government who takes, you know, makes laws for the entire world. Remember that the only source of international law are basically agreements between states. The resolutions of the GA are not laws, are not binding on the world. It's basically states who, who voluntarily enter agreement to treaties that is what creates international law, which we will discuss, by the way, in the next section, international law. So, again, what does, what does the International Court of Justice do? There is, no there is no worldwide law, although there is international law, right, based on treaties. Um, there is no uh, worldwide government, no worldwide police, so basically they are there to do what? So, here's what, why it's, uh, here's, here's what makes it important and interesting. By the, uh, first of all, it, is, uh, it has 15 members uh, uh, with a 9-year mandate, 5 of them are elected every 3 years, renewed every 3 years, elected by both the Security Council and the General Assembly, a majority in, in both, which is interesting. And located in The Hague, Netherlands, where many uh, courts at the international level are located. So, again, what does it do? Well, one thing that, that it does, it, is, it advises the Security Council and the General Assembly in matters of international law. <coughs> it is a very unique advisory body which has, uh, you know, knowledge and uh, collected information about uh, international law, so international norms as well, right? 
right? So this advisory function of, you know, this is what the state is, state of affairs is regarding international law, we can say that, right? We can, we can, we can give you the uh, important, you know, consultation on this, that yeah, this is how things stand on the international law, let's say, regarding child rights or whatever. So that's, that's one function. You're going to say, well, that doesn't look very important. Well, the second one is that states can actually sue each other, can actually sue each other at the International Court of Justice. And they have done so. Uh, the two states that have a dispute, they can sue each other, and, they, and there have been uh, such uh, occasions, and the International Court of Justice will take a decision. The problem is, as I said, that it is, you know, it's only enforceable if the states voluntarily agree to enforce it, right? When a state sues you means that you were in a conflict that you're probably not willing to, you know, agree with that state, so you're not going to enforce it, and that's, that's basically the situation with states suing each other. So that's not really an important function. It's the third function that is really, the, the, in a way, the more relevant at this point, who knows in the future, is its role of arbitration. So, advisory, um, function states suing each other, but the most important, the more important one is arbitration. Meaning, states can agree to bring issues that they have uh, uh, they dispute, right? Uh, say uh, Nigeria and Cameroon. Uh, there is a border between them, right? They have a common border which is very rich in oil, and there's not clear who has ownership of that territory. Well, how can you solve this? The states clearly can't agree, because otherwise it wouldn't be a debate. debate. Um, so they can't enter into a treaty with each other. They can go to, you know, war with each other if they're stupid, right? Well, states try to avoid that, uh, as rational actors, as liberals would say. Or, they can actually bring it to a third party. Remember the function of mediation, one of the types is arbitration. Well, that's what the ICJ can do. And many states have done that, because this is a rational, peaceful way of solving conflicts, and it's recognized as a mutual uh, uh, arbiter who is uh, aware of in the state of international law, on, on, on precedent, on the tradition of international law, and states have done that successfully, and in the case I mentioned, Nigeria versus Cameroon, they have done that successfully, even if it was actually about a very important resource. So arbitration is an important function. Okay, so I mentioned that one of the important uh, dimensions of the UN today is development. Indeed, if you look on the, which, uh, as you will look on the, that list of all the agencies and programs of the UN, you will see how many there are. Let's group these programs and agencies into two major categories. There are the UN programs proper, which means that these are programs started by the UN, by the Secretariat or by the different bodies in the UN. They have these programs of development. And for example, uh, and I'm going to list a few, uh, there's the, uh, these are programs of, of the UN meaning they belong to the UN. So there's UNEP, there's UNICEF, uh, there is UNHCR, there is UN Development Program, just some examples. And what are these? The UNEP is the United Nations Environment Program. Obviously it deals with global environmental problems. UNICEF deals with child, children's protection, the pro promotion and protection of children's rights. Uh, UNHCR uh, deals with, um, uh, is the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. It's the biggest organization in the world dealing with refugees, and that's one of the greatest problems in the world. There are millions of people, uh, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people who are not home and who can't go home, refugees, but who deals with them? Who can take care of them, right? So these are programs who are directed at doing that. UN Development Program, again, the largest world agency for technical development assistance. So giving assistance throughout the world. And these are all programs developed by the UN. But besides these, and these are, by the way, just some examples. There's a long list which you should check out. Uh, besides these UN programs, there are also Autonomous agencies. And as the name indicates, 
<coughs> these are agencies that are not part, they are not, you know, intrinsically part of the uh, UN. They're not their own programs, right? These are, however, associated with the UN. And why are they associated with the UN? For the very uh, exact reason that I, that I uh, told you about, uh, that there is no other pro platform similar to the UN in terms of where, where issues that concern the entire world can be met and where people, when different um, uh, states can meet and start different uh, initiatives to address worldwide problems. There's no such worldwide platform but the UN. So these autonomous agencies have their own budget, their own structure, their own leadership and whatever, but they're associated with the UN, are part of the UN, basically family, UN structure. Uh, not structure, but UN connected to the UN. However, with their own budget and leadership and so on. And again, think of it again, UN is this worldwide, here's the world, here's this platform, and the only one which has a view of the world, right, so, so to speak. And then, if I want to do to deal with a problem that affects, uh, I don't know, nuclear weapons for the entire world, well, where can I go to attach myself to, but to this worldwide organization? So, uh, let, I'm going to list a few, but again, you have a, a list on... Um, on canvas, so I'm just going to list them briefly um, and, and also explain them briefly. Yeah, but again, just a few examples. Uh, the World Health Organization, right? Who decides, for example, that there is a pandemic? There is an epidemic that will cover the entire globe. Where do you, you know, which institution is going to say to the radio stations, well, announce it, right? It's not the U.S. government. The U.S. government doesn't have the information, the resources, the knowledge. What does the U.S. government know about what happens in some corner in Sri Lanka, right? It's, it's the World Health Organization that collects all this worldwide information, and you have specialists there who then, you know, when we had the most famous one was... Mm, not even sure. It wasn't the uh, Ebola. It was a uh, bird flu, I think, or swine flu. But the point was that we were literally waiting on you know TV, radio, internet. To, will they declare it as a pandemic? Right. So that's the World Health Organization dealing with you know basically health issues around the world. Then there is the Food and Agriculture Organization, mostly about hunger and improving food security. It's an umbrella organization, right? Uh, then there is UNESCO, which deals with the uh, scientific and cultural heritage of, of mankind. It has this famous list of world heritage uh, places. So you might travel around the world and see a sign, this is a world heritage. Well, how do you know that? Because it's on this worldwide list of heritage uh, things. IAE is an interesting thing, which we'll discuss a little bit later in a different section. It's, it's the International Atomic Energy Agency. It's completely independent. Uh, it, it's, it's autonomous. Nobody runs it. It's basically a technical agency uh, making sure that nuclear, weapon, nuclear uh, technology is used and developed uh, peacefully. We will discuss about it. But I'm just giving you examples of how different issues that all of them that can affect the entire world and they are their own agencies but they're you know, attached to the UN because there's no other worldwide platform. Or let, and then there are, let me erase this, there, uh, within autonomous agencies there's a specific group that I like to usually deal with separately because they're so interesting. And let's call them technical agencies. So these are agencies, and your book talks about them nicely, or uh, technical or specialized agencies which have nothing to do with anything political. They literally are you know, bodies of specialized uh, knowledge or information that the entire world needs. And it's completely neutral because it's just specific scientific expertise. And I'm going to give you some uh, examples without writing them down, and you have them listed on those links, and you can identify them. The Universal Postal Union. Well, who's going to set the universal standards for how much postage you need and whatever, how to organize worldwide postage, right? You have to be able to send something from here to... You know, Sri Lanka, as I said, although nowadays you might send an email. But the whole postal system around the world needs to be neutrally you know, managed by a neutral organization. Or the International Civil Aviation Organization, right? 
the standards for air traffic. Who decides how high uh, you know, it, it is safe to... I mean, this is all technical information. There's no interest here. The point is you have to have this independent, neutral body, and these are what these technical uh, agencies do. The International Maritime Organization, right? Again, setting the framework, the parameters that we can all use, it's like traffic signs. It's like traffic. Who decides that, right? You need to have a technical organization so that they're all the same because nowadays we travel, we fly, we, we go on, on ships anywhere in the world, we send letters. The World Intellectual Property Organizations, right? P piracy. The World Meteorological Organization, of course, because weather doesn't have borders, doesn't have borders, so who collects all this information? It's very technical. The International Telecommunications Union, about radio frequencies and how they're used and, and allocated around the world. And again, radio fre frequencies do not have borders. In fact, although you have range and so on, so you see these are very interesting. And then there is another category that you know falls within you know the general autonomous agencies, just like these. But it's nice to put them separately because they are so important, and we're going to talk about them separately. By the way, when we talk about the international economy, and these are financial or economic organizations, and under this fall, the World Bank. Uh, and the International Monetary Fund. Completely separate, I mean, not completely, but their own organization, you know, they have their own charter, their own constitution, their own membership, separate, different states are members of that, but they're associated, you know, linked with the UN because, for the same reason that I uh, uh, mentioned, the World Bank, International Monetary Fund. Uh, finally, let's talk about the key function of the the key function of the United Nations which is peacekeeping and uh, very briefly right um, although not necessarily mentioned in the charter it has developed and I'm just going to discuss about your book discuss uh, tells you how peacekeeping uh, is done you know, uh, the fact that it, it takes a Security Council mandate, uh, who gives a mandate for three to six months, when they decide there's a threat for peace, and whatever, whatever. And interesting, it's all in the book, so I'm not going to go through that. Uh, once they give you the, give the mandate for a peacekeeping operation, then the, it's the Secretary General who actually going to run the whole thing, and the Secretariat. So you see these other guys who run the thing. Um, the money, however, comes by approval from the General Assembly. Again, importance of having control of the budget. What I'm going to ta talk about specifically and briefly is the three types of peacekeeping. Right? Your books talk, your books talk in different ways about this. Minx kind of gets close to what I what I'm trying to say here. So uh, let's let's just do, separate traditional peacekeeping from complex peacekeeping and also from, let's say, a third category here, peace building, which Binks, I don't think it uh, talks about. So traditional peacekeeping has two major functions and I'm going to separate them. Uh, one of them is observer function and the other one is the actual peacekeeping. So what are peacekeepers? The traditional function. So the traditional peacekeeping is the idea of, um, well, again, two functions. One is observer. Observers are officers, unarmed military officers under the UN aegis, so they have you know blue helmets or white helmets, who go and watch and report. That's all they do. That's observer function. For example, there is a ceasefire between Israelis and uh, Palestinians or Hezbollah or whatever. So who's going to monitor the peace, the, the ceasefire? Because both sides can accuse each other for, oh, they broke the peace, now let's bomb them, whatever. This is what observers, observers are used, and this is why they are military, but they're unarmed and they come from the UN. Their role is to maintain, to calm, conflict by, by reporting. Or can report on uh, trespasses on human rights and whatever, that's the observers. The traditional peacekeeping is as such, the famous, uh, you know, uh, blue helmets, these are, what's important about traditional peacekeeping, these are lightly armed soldiers, they don't have tanks, they don't have, uh, they don't have um, artillery, they don't have heavy weapons, they don't have airplanes and whatever, 
They are lightly armed, but they have some arms for and which can they can only use for self defense. And what they do traditional peacekeeping is they only go in when the parties in conflict agree to it. This is why it's peacekeeping, right? Traditional. The two parties are at war, they want to have a ceasefire, they want to have peace, but you know, when you're at war, you get to killing each other, then it's hard to trust each other. So this is when they agree to have peacekeepers, a third party peacekeepers, to just be in between them. And that's all they do. It's sort of a buffer zone. Now, of course, there are many risks, and sometimes tempers run high, and uh, they can get overwhelmed by those parties at war who can't restrain themselves. And this is why we also have complex peacekeeping. This is developed a little bit later, um, which, in which there is a more active military role, a more active military intervention. There are also non-military functions. For example, in complex peacekeeping, it's not only, you know, you have some your buffer zone there and you can even, you know, perhaps shoot back and whatever. But what's more important is that uh, they are there also perform functions. For example, peace, complex peacekeeping, they can organize elections, supervise the implementation of, of peace agreements, actively protect civilians, um, mediate. Uh, so you see it's a more active role in peacekeeping. Uh, but again, this developed over time because it takes, a, a, you know, a kind of trespass on the, to, on the fighting sides. Um, you know, there has been a lot of clamor about why not create peacemaking forces which have airplanes, have bombs, have everything they can to make peace, force the peace. It never really worked out because that's a, a, um, a, you know, it's a more complex thing. Remember that, by the way, Security Council can uh, justify, uh, you know, remember, according to Article 7 of the Charter, the Security Council can decide that there's a threat to peace and pass a resolution by which it will decide on the application of force to push back whoever broke peace. That was the case in Iraq in, to, in 1991, not in 2003. 1991, when it invaded Kuwait and it broke the, the peace, it was a clear threat to worldwide security. And that's the United the Security Council passed a resolution in which it approved the use of force. But here's the difference. Who sent troops? Not the UN. It was under UN mandate, but it was different countries who sent their own militaries. Because that's the point. The UN doesn't really have a military. It can it when it, when it the, the troops it has when it uses blue helmets are basically borrowed. They borrow soldiers from, from countries, they have officers, they have a, an officer corps, the UN, generals and so on, but they borrow themselves, come from state militaries, right? Uh, the UN doesn't have an academy to train officers. But they borrow forces uh, who are put with under these blue helmets and then they become UN soldiers, so to speak, right? But only for peacekeeping things. When it's about the use of force, it's not the UN who does that. The UN gives the mandate, it is the member states. And the point about peacemaking was why doesn't the UN have such a force? Or why not create such a force on a more stable basis? We're not there yet. However, a more complex peacekeeping operation can be more firm and can be more all-encompassing, not just you know, stopping them from shooting, because that doesn't create peace, remember. Peace is not created when you stop shooting. That's not peace, remember peace studies. You have to create the institutions of peaceful living together, elections and security, food security and, and administration. The world needs to function in order to have lasting peace, otherwise you don't have it. Finally, peace building addresses exactly that. And peace building is the most complex form sort of peace of peacemaking, peacekeeping. And it's basically after, let's say, after a conflict, is the reconstruction of that society. And that happened in East Timor and so on, and then in Kosovo. And it's when UN troops obviously get borrowed and whatever, or under UN mandate, we engage in running that society. In, for example, in Kosovo, for many years, the UN troops, again, borrowed, not their troops, but troops from different countries under UN mandate, they were the police. So the local police was actually UN troops. Again, not belonging to the UN. I need to reinforce this because there are many uh, false uh, information. And it's so creating and maintaining law and order, 
Peace building is also part of reconstruction, reconstructing the economy, investing, running the administration, running elections. Sometimes the operations of creating a, a lasting peace are so complex that it, it involves basically having a role in running the, the place. Uh, and that has happened. Again, Kosovo, East Timor, because there was no infrastructure. And it, they obviously demanded it, the locals, it wasn't enforced on them, right? But they didn't have the resources for that, and that is peace building. Is peacekeeping successful? Well, that is the article that you were, you were assigned to read from the Minsk uh, reader, right? Uh, essential readings in world politics. So, read that article, you will get questions from that on the test. And with that, uh, we have concluded this lecture on the United Nations. Uh, in the next two days, you will also have a lecture on the European Union and a brief lecture on NATO.